uh, that'd be funny. Yeah, you, yeah. you know what? Uh, we're live, by the way. Welcome, everyone. Um, but what I like to do, what we're talking about here is switching um, someone who, you know, they called to pitch you. And now, you know, here's Lindsay turning that person around. So so if it's like something that you, you highly suspect, you know, this is this is BS, right? Like the home warranty people or the uh, not the home warranty, the, the car warranty people, which we get all the time. Um, but you could say, you know what? I can make money. I could earn money faster than you can steal it. You know, uh, would you like to see? you know and, and then you could feel good you could sleep good at night you're not ripping people off i mean it's pretty freaking awesome uh That's so crazy. yeah <laughs> good times good to see daisy gail this actually brings up an, um i think an interesting topic which uh since it's just us girls talking here today let's let's take it up right <laughs> i've had a challenging morning so far uh, dealing with um, technical things. I don't like dealing with technical things. So, um, but uh, any of you seen the movie, The Boiler Room uh, with uh, Giovanni Ribisi, uh, who else was in it? Uh, Vin Diesel, um, Ben Affleck. It was about the uh, the what has later become known as the Wolf of Wall Street. What was the guy's name? He ran this, this like boiler room, which is another way to say uh, phone room where they were, they were cold calling uh, people to sell stocks. Now, the interesting thing about this, it wasn't, these weren't like, you know, stock brokers that were like on Wall Street and supposedly legitimate. They were, they were like criminals and they were running this, this boiler room and selling and, and a lot of the salespeople, if the movie was accurate, it was very well done, by the way. Uh, but the uh, but if the movie was accurate, a lot of the salespeople had no idea that they were selling garbage. They just thought they were, you know, their kids, they're getting into the world of stocks and investing and man, they're going to kick ass and make a six figure income and they were selling crap. Anyway, so this guy wound up going to prison. The, uh, the guy who ran the whole thing. And uh, but I remember a few of the a few of the scenes from that room, because I know one of the well, the book that we're getting into now here in our mastermind group has to do with sales posture and being able to present ideas in a way that positions you and your offer as as the prize. Y yes, Lindsay, that was the guy. Yes, that's the guy. Jordan Belfort. <clears throat> But anyway, the uh, so the movie was a dramatization of that. And then I know there was another movie, which I think was specifically about that. But the boiler room was inspired by this guy's uh, story out in uh, Long Island, New York. But in that movie, <laughs> it also had some very good demonstrations of what I would call posture. OK, so I want to talk with everybody about here today is a little bit of posture. OK, now this has nothing to do with how my morning has gone so far because there's no posture application to technical problems, right? If when technical stuff goes wrong, you can't argue with the technology, right? You can't convince the technology, you, you can't persuade it, right? Mm -hmm. So, so which, I mean, you think about, since I'm talking about movies already, when you think about, uh, you know, some of the sci-fi stuff like the Matrix or Terminator, right? Things like this, where, where you know, here are, technologies that have become self-aware and uh decided that you you know with your body and stuff you're imperfect we need to get you off the planet right let's exterminate these rodents or whatever these are right so that's that's an interesting that's pretty far out although the way a lot of the world's been going might not be that far out um but we get to we get to the whole idea of actually communicating with other sentient beings OK, so what does that mean? That means that there's there's feeling and, and consciousness and, and all this, that, that this is this is a, um, you know, someone you can interact with persuasively. OK, we'll take it down to a basic level. How many of us have animals? I know we got a lot of animal lovers here. OK, now now. Not including cats, because I don't know how do you convince a cat to do anything? Maybe you cat lovers would know 
and they're just kind of they're in their own world. <laughs> in fact, I remember seeing a comic strip where it had um, there was there was this guy talking to his dog, and uh, you know Rover said Ro Rover, uh, would you like a treat? You know Rover this Rover that, and and uh, and what the dog heard right in the next frame, what the dog heard was. Rover, blank, 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 treat, blank, 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 Rover, blank, blank, blank. Like that's all he got was like his name and, and like a treat. And then they did the same thing with the cat, right? And here's this person talking to their cat. And all the cat heard in the next frame was nothing, like just emptiness. <laughs> okay. So I don't understand cats. But let's say that you're, you're, uh, you're training, you know, here's a dog. Okay. And, uh, and they, they can learn, you know, to do things, not just based on the words you used. And yes, they, they do get, you know, commands, right. You can see, I'm sure you can jump on YouTube and you can see police dogs are highly trained, you know, animals that, uh, they, they understand English apparently. Right. So sit means sit and attack means attack. Right. So, so things like that. Uh, but for the most part, you uh, communicate with an animal, right? and this is what I have found, uh, with the body postures, the voice inflections, the, the physiology, right? So the words themselves actually come into play. But, but I mean, I could say, and I do all the time, I tell my dogs how bad they are, and they wag their tail, right? But I'm, I'm you know, I'm saying it as, as I guess, their alpha and, and their ally, right? I'm not going to hurt them. I'm not really condemning them. Like, oh, you're so bad. Oh, how about a treat, right? And so they don't understand the word bad, right? They understand my physiology. And I'm kind of a dog whisperer, right? It's just something about dogs and I just, just get along really good. Um, so a lot of people are, are surprised when you know, I meet somebody new and there's their dog and they come right up to me and they say, oh, they never do that. Well, they do that with me. So anyway, there's that. All right, let's take it up a notch. All right, so now we're, we're dealing with higher, more evolved creatures called humans, right? Which is what we're involved in most of the time, arguably more, more evolved, right? So, so here is the human interaction. And, and so part of that communication certainly is the words. It's nice that, uh, Gail, eat your lunch, my friend. Eat that. Yeah, very good. <laughs> um, but part of the, you know, the, the usefulness of language, right, is revealed that we can use words to convey ideas better than we did, I don't know, a few thousand years ago with the, the grunts and stuff. Uh, again, allegedly, we're, we're evolved, right? We've got language, although grunts work too, which brings me to the next idea, which is the same thing in terms of a posture or a physiology, a, um, a way of communicating which speaks in some cases more thoroughly than the language themselves. And I'm saying this as a guy who, who appreciates the written word. We just read James Allen, Eight Pillars of Prosperity. Tremendous you know, written word, spectacular ideas that were conveyed by the specific selections uh, that he made with which words to describe, you know, these, in this case, these pillars, these principles upon which you could build a prosperous life. Um, that's great. You know what I didn't get? I didn't get the lecture. I didn't get to hear James Allen speak to me. I didn't get to have that dialogue with him. So he damn well had to convey in a complete manner, you know, here's the, here's the full idea, which I'm intending for you, reader. Okay, here's the full idea. And I'm going to do that with the written word. That takes a bit of talent. All right. But uh, but here, let's say let's say we're on social media. Let's say that you're or you're talking to a customer, or like I know Lindsay's got an appointment at least one today with with a customer. There is a way of communicating that uh, you don't have to have as many words, okay? You don't have to be as eloquent or has uh, have as as uh, broad a vocabulary as James Allen or something to be able to to what accomplish the mission. To, to convey the idea, to transfer uh, whatever you know and that you're looking to transfer to that other person, to make that happen. And, and for that person on the other end of the communication to, to get it, right? Like they understand what you mean, right? So, so you, described, you described the situation or the item, right? You could try this with, uh, with an item. 
like for example, uh, phone, right? So you, let's say you were talking to someone who had never, you know, seen a phone before you could describe the physical attributes of the phone and, and you could do so in such a way that they would, they would be able to see the picture of it pretty much in their mind. Okay. And so <clears throat> there are other things though. There are other things which cannot be described. Like for example, and here's a, an example that I got from, from somebody. Uh, this was interesting as it related to someone attempting to explain to their wife, their, their husband, their spouse, their partner about some business opportunity they just discovered. And they need to gain the agreement of their wife, their spouse, their partner. Now, they just discovered this thing. They didn't know that this existed a little while ago, but now they met you. And so you enlightened them. Okay. And now they're going to go attempt to describe what they just learned from you to the third party who they're using as a, a scapegoat, as an excuse to basically not buy right now. I need to go explain it to my wife. Yeah, sure you do. Okay, fine. So, so that would be likened to, in the example that I got, uh, trying to describe the taste of chocolate. Can anyone here describe the taste of chocolate to someone who's never experienced chocolate before? Well, it's kind of, um, well, sweet, but also like, um, uh, well, it could be bitter uh, and, and it's creamy, but um, it could be, uh, well, it, it's kind of, it's hard. It's not like a cream that you, it's not a liquid, although it could be a liquid, right? So you see how I'm struggling with this? Like, how do you describe the taste of chocolate? You pretty much don't. You, you put it in your mouth, okay? That's how you understand what chocolate is, <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> so can you save yourself a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of words and a lot of, you know, verbosity, right? By just saying, this stuff is awesome. Try this. Best thing you'll ever have in your mouth, right? Sold, okay? Now, I did that with, in this present time, a bit of feigned enthusiasm, although I, I know what chocolate is. I've, I've eaten it plenty. Uh, but, but you see, I had, I had a bit of emotion involved in that. And, and rather than, you know, belaboring, you know, trying to explain what this stuff is, here, have some of this. And doing it with, with a posture. And this is what I'm getting at here with everyone. And this is where we're going to be going with this book, which hopefully you've started reading. Again, the, the book of the month is Pitch Anything by Orrin Claff. But there is a, a, um, a certain frame, which we could say is, um, if you look at the, the entire scene of, of the communication cycle, there is, you know, here's the potential buyer, here's the, the seller, okay? So here's the person looking to convey an idea within a framework to the person who they're attempting to serve and to and to what to persuade to per convince to convince to to induce some decision on their part. So was it more? Let me ask you this: Was it more enticing for you to hear my explanation of chocolate, or if I was actually holding out a piece of chocolate, saying, "Hey, this is the best stuff in the world," right? I would say the second one with less words was more enticing. Why we're getting to uh, how communication is actually received and it's, and it's received based on, uh, the emotional state and, and the, the perception of who's delivering that communication. So, uh, in fact, Lindsay and I had a conversation about this just a couple of days ago is, is the idea that, well, admittedly, uh, she and myself and, and pretty much everybody here, I mean, we can't be, we can't be all things to all people, right? I may not be, the messenger for that person. Lindsay is awesome. I don't know about this, this wacky Italian guy, Lavinia, but oh, Lindsay, yeah, I'll buy her stuff, right? Okay, well, okay then, fine, right? So you can't be all things to all people all the time. Uh, however, if you have found, no matter where, what business you're in or no matter who you are, if you have found that you're less than persuasive then I think what we need to take a look at is, is the posture. I mean, if you know your offer is good, here's chocolate, it's good, I know it. And yet you're not connecting, you're not transferring that enthusiasm that you already have to, to your target audience. Well, well what, what is it about you? Is there, is there something that, that you're not communicating? You may be using the right words, you may even have a script for whatever that's worth. 
but if there's if there's a tendency to to introvert or to which is another way to say to seek approval in other words if if you're requiring validation from outside to tell you you're doing it right or something or that you're hoping you're doing it right or you're introverting wondering if you're doing it right well that doesn't sound like the 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 convincing posture of the person who who just man this is this stuff's awesome have some chocolate you see that there's the disconnect taking it back down to the animal world people say well animals can sense fear right so so like here's the the same dog who came up to me with his tail wagging who you know has a adverse reaction to another person same dog So what's that about? You know, so someone has some, um, you know, adverse uh, sort of, uh, you know, maybe, maybe from their past, right? They have uh, a program that they run reactively when they confront uh, a dog. In fact, I've seen this uh, explained in, in uh, what book was it? My goodness, I think it was Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. I don't know how many of you have read that, okay? But that's like the psychological Bible for people who are trading, like stocks and, and securities and things like this. It's really about, you know, staying cool and being objective and not getting emotionally involved with the charts. Remember, we kind of started this conversation today with the idea that I cannot convince technology, right? I can't cause technology to change its mind or something. Um, whereas the same thing with, you know, here's someone attempting to to put on a winning trade, okay? And they're looking at technical analysis and all this. There's no personalities involved there except their own. Are they getting emotionally involved? Oh, I think oh this this could be a, I could make a lot of money. Oh, I don't want to leave money on the table. Fear of missing out, right? So there's all the stuff that that causes people in that world to to make blunders. All that emotion. Uh, you know, rather than just being cool, calm and calculated about it, win or lose, and you'll do both. Okay. But to consistently win, you've got to be consistently like emotionally detached from it. And, and so in that book, uh, one of the things that, that uh, the author talked about was the idea of irrational, irrational uh, emotions. Uh, as it relates to, in this case, a dog, right? So here's the person who, as a full-grown adult, you know, here's here's a chihuahua or something, and they're like all freaked out by it. And maybe you know people like this. Maybe you know people who just have, you know, like a, a deathly fear of dogs or something, okay? Well, it turns out that that person, when they were a child, you know, they got bit by the dog and it was a big, you know, freaking dog or whatever. But all dogs equal all dogs. All dogs, Right. So here's the, you know, the Pekingese or something. <laughs> and they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> Not rational. Okay, so, so dealing with our ability to deal with what is, uh, is dependent on our ability to, to be in present time and fully confront, here's what's real, here's what's happening, right? Not yesterday, not when I was a kid, okay? And here's this customer right now in present time, who is not the customer I had yet last week who didn't buy, right? Or here's the, here's the, the spouse, the, the, uh, the, the coworker, the relationship that uh, is not the same experience as, you know, the one that, that went awry last week, last year, 10,000 years ago, whatever. Okay. So, so being in present time and being able to fully experience what is real right now to whatever degree you can allows you what much more, um, ability to, to, uh, yes, have posture, persuade, convince, um, you know, deliver a communication in such a way that it could be received in present time by the person you're attempting to deliver it to. That requires that you extrovert. That requires that you, you've got attention to put on them and that you're not introverted about it all. Thinking about the past and, oh, how I blundered before and how nothing worked out. Oh, right. So, so being able to extrovert requires that you, you have to be the prize, to use Oren Claff's words. All right. Again, dig into this book. Guys, there's so much great stuff in there. Uh, we're going to be covering the first two chapters on book study on Monday night. 
but what's the prize here? What's the, you know, what's the, the grail or the golden goose or, or whatever, right? Is it the customer? Is it, is it um, you need to gain their, their uh, love or something? Okay, well, now they're the prize. But you've got to have the posture to know that you're the prize or your offer, right? Which you, is in, you're included and in, hopefully you're an asset to the offer, right? So here's, here's you know, what we're here to talk about. That's the prize, the solution to your problems. That's the prize. Your problem is you don't know what chocolate is. I'm about to solve your problem with 100% confidence and certainty. Have some chocolate. Great. A simple example, I know, but you see how, how when we're just present and, and I mean, if you really did meet somebody who has never tasted chocolate before, assuming you like chocolate and some people, eh, like whatever, it's okay, I guess, but eh, right. I prefer Brussels sprouts. All right, fine. Eat your Brussels sprouts. But, but look, if you were like a chocolate enthusiast or something, if you were a chocolate salesman and you met somebody who'd never had chocolate, I mean, the sample is going to come out of your, your, uh, your sack so fast. You're going to sign them up and it's going to happen so fast. And with no hesitation, right. You're going to go enlighten that person. You're going to gain a customer. So how does this, uh, how do we boil this down to things that we can do right now? Um, well, I'm engaged in this stuff every day, every day. I've got back-to-back -back appointments today as soon as we're done here with people, thank you, not with technology. Thank you, thank you. I get to deal with people, <laughs> which is, you know, a blessing and a curse, but, um, but I get to deal with, with good people, right? So that's a blessing. And, uh, and I'm, going to, I'm going to induce action on the part of these people. They've got something that they want. Okay, today I'm going to be meeting with people regarding uh, getting businesses going. So they've got something they want, and that is what? Profitability, um, uh, to create a lifestyle, and to have all the advantages of, um, you know, the self-determinism of being your own boss and location freedom and, and all the wonderful things that come with being successful in online business. And without hesitation and without doubt, and with full certainty, I'm going to communicate, here's, here's the opportunity. Here's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, if they qualify, right, I think you should partner with us. I think you should do this. <clears throat> and I'm going to give them every reason why. And I'm going to solve every reason why they think they can't. And I'm going to do that with no hesitation, no introversion, very matter of fact. And, and that is what's going to be communicated. And that's what will be received. And if they have ears to hear, then they will hear. The rest of the story is, you know, sometimes sometimes people don't, right? Sometimes people can't, or they they need they need to hear it from Lindsay or something because they don't like my hair. You know, Lindsay's got better hair. Okay, not rational, not rational. I get it. We're dealing with we're dealing with other humans, you know, and rationality is not to be assumed. I remember reading this um, this book. Some years ago, it was called uh, Common Sense and the Music Business. The two don't often mix. <laughs> and it talked about, uh, you know, here's, here's uh, uh, rich people that wanted to, to get into the music business. And here's uh, rich people who are now poor people having gotten into the music business. <laughs> what a wreck. Um, yeah, tough, tough world, tough world. But that's again, that's driven by by emotion. Think about this: when you when you hear a piece of music, and some of you are more musically inclined than others, or more affected by music than others, when you hear a piece of music, um, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a combination of frequencies and uh, rhythm. There's time, right? There's repetition over time. Here's the here's the riff. Here's the chord progression, right? So if we broke it down into you know dissecting you know, here are the component parts of music. Well, that's nice, I, I suppose, if you're a sound engineer and, you know, if, if you're doing like, you know, you're creating the product, that's fine. But but what is the what is the actual product? The actual product is how it makes the listener feel, how they, you know, enjoy 
that aesthetic experience. So just like we were talking about words and, and the usefulness of words, here's frequencies and rhythms and timings and, and instruments and all this, oh, great. Okay, and, and they have use, they have use, but what is the use of it? What is the use of that communication? Well, to cause that emotional state for, for the person who's, who's hearing it, to, to conjure up you know, the, the feelings of whether it's you know, good or bad. I mean, some people listen to music to be miserable, right? Um, I was saying, <laughs> just saying to my wife um, that, that at my funeral, you see, I want Bach. Uh, like the most miserable stuff Bach ever composed with the organs and it's all very dark and everyone's wearing black. I think that, now there you go. Now that's a funeral. <laughs> Bach wrote some good stuff too. But uh, <laughs> but uh, does anybody listen to, to like that, you know, real somber organ music to like be happy? I mean, you think about the um, like horror movies and stuff. Or any any movie when they score a movie, right? So here's the dialogue, here's the actors, and if you ever get to see, you know, like a unfinished, you know, film, then you get to see, you know, it's it's bereft of a lot of the emotions that that come with, you know, here's the fight scene or the intrigue or the, you know, the sorrow and the loss, right? But the music, right? I mean, this stuff it's very predictable. Sometimes I just and this is maybe some more sales training for you. Right. Since I'm going to be on the sales training kick with you guys for the next month as we read this book. Um, but if you can if you can just watch a movie. And just see if you can disregard the words. OK, and just listen to the score, listen to the music. Here's the violins. Here's that, right. So what's happening there? What's happening there is the director and, and editors. Right. They are they are communicating with you via not words not words. Okay. So see if you can kind of parse that out. Right. It's kind of like, um, anybody here ever done karaoke? I'm sure Gail has Gary, Gail, you're a karaoke maven, right? No, no. Okay. So, so, uh, so what did they do? They took the lyrics out. They took the, the vocal track out of the music and here's just, you know, just the instrumentation, you know, and now, uh, you get to go do the vocals, right? So that's kind of what we're talking about here is that if you can do that just in your mind, right? Pick a movie that you've, you've seen plenty of times, you know, for me, that might be, you know, the matrix or one of the Lord of the Rings movies or something <sighs> or Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire episode four for the 10 millionth time. Uh, my daughter loves Harry Potter, especially number four, the Goblet of Fire. Um, we call it the goblet of other things now, something, something silly every time, because I'm like enough with this goblet of fire thing. But, um, but if you could, if you could just, you know, take the words out and just listen to the musical score. I think that's some sales training right there. Right. Because now when you're, when you're speaking to someone, you can almost I don't say I, I exactly do this, but I can almost hear the, the musical score of how that's coming out, right? I can almost, almost hear the music of the, you know, of the presentation. And that's where you get people who, and hopefully this is something that, uh, you know, if you're communicating with other people, then you can also recognize that you do to whatever degree um, where you can improvise, where you don't need a script. Right. And don't we all have to do this every day? Of course. Of course. You're having a new encounter with a person. Maybe you already know that person, maybe not, but you're having a new encounter with this person and having a dialogue. And, and you didn't get the script before you showed up, you know, in that meeting or when you walked down the hall and talked to your spouse, right? There was no script for that. So you're going to have to do this, right? You're going to have to communicate now off the cuff. Okay. Um, but maybe consider. You know, what music is playing? Or what music do you want to play for that person? When I'm doing a uh, webinar, like presentation, uh, I don't have music playing, although there is a, a rhythm and a cadence to, the, to what I'm presenting. There are pauses. There are um, obviously, like if you listen to any like comedian, 
right? That's a sales pitch. They're, they're selling you jokes, right? And they want you to have that, that emotional reaction to that. So they, they have the timing and the, and the cadence and the, and the pauses and then the snap, you know, you know, unexpected, you know, punchlines and whatever, little jokes, right? So how does that happen with or without music? That is just like music has a rhythm, your communication has a rhythm. And, and you can do that spontaneously when you've already got the words, you already got, you know, the pitch, the offer, the whatever it is, the thing, the idea you're attempting to convey, where you can just go and encounter, here's that ideal target audience. The comedian stands in front of the, you know, the audience doing their stand-up act or whatever, and they're connecting with that audience and they've done it before. Okay. So, so they know where the pauses are and where, what's going to get the laughs, right? Probably um, the guy, well, is the highest paying comedian, the highest paid comedian in history was uh, Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld, right? Jerry Seinfeld. He would write a joke every day and he called, he talked about not breaking the chain. So every day he would write a joke and a lot of it was crap. Okay. But, but the consistency of that, that was his, his art. That was his trade, his, his craft, which he intended to master. Well, how do you master it? You do it every day, right? And, and then he would go, even after having become uh, wildly successful with you know, TV shows and all this, he would go and do stand-up acts and try jokes on, on the audience, right? Here's some, here's some new material. Let's see how it goes, right? And it wasn't all good, you know. So, um, but that's the kind of thing where, if you're thinking that um, that I can't have this posture, this this you know certain dominant you know uh, and convincing thing because other people have done it, there's nothing original here. Think again, think again. This is something where, like I said earlier where you can't really saturate the market because there are people, and I've seen it many times, there are people that they, they were presented an offer in the past by somebody else, but now that they met you and you communicated it in a different way, same data, same facts, but you communicated it in a different way, sign me up, damn it, sign me up. And look, all of us are engaged in, in sales, uh, you know, uh, selling our ideas, uh, you know, getting, getting work from, you know, the, the boss or the, the employer, the, the cu customer, the client, uh, the act of selling itself, right? So um, listen to, uh, if you haven't listened to it in a while, I know I sent all of you this audio on um, uh, email. Yes. And I think it's also in our, it's in our member's site. Um, the Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. Have you guys listened to The Stranger Secret recently? Okay, I've heard this thing probably a thousand times. It's 32 minutes long. And in that, Earl Nightingale talks about this whole concept of, of sales and selling, which isn't limited to just the person who's got their salesman hat on. Okay, it's something we all do. Um, we can be more deliberate and more and more persuasive with that regardless of your your role whatever whatever post you're manning and i believe you should be hence this book that we're about to to dive into starting this week so we got kind of a mixed bag of topics here i want to thank you all um and if anybody wants to come out please come on out um but i want to thank you all for for brightening my day because just before we went live on here Lindsay asked me how i was doing and i said i've had a very challenging morning uh, but i can see that it's getting better now that i'm here with you and she enjoyed that. Um, so thank you, Gail. Gail's got to go. See you, Gail. You have an awesome appointment. I know you've got four meetings right after this. See, so Gail's kicking butt. All right. So Catherine, Daisy, Edward, Lindsay, anything that, uh, that struck a nerve with you that you'd like to take up further that we brought up here today? Please come on out. All right. So then... Um, if not, then let me just take a look at our calendar because I know, um, oh my goodness. Uh, yes, we have a clear calendar today. So it's high production day. So let's produce. And then uh, tomorrow, of course, we're gonna have Fun Friday 
And I'm going to think of a couple jokes for you guys because you deserve some jokes. And uh, yeah, and then we'll get on with it. So last call. Anybody want to come out today? No? Okay. I know it's been a little quiet in the peanut gallery. Lindsay, you have a comment? Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you. Nailed it. For me, that's great. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. I'm glad I showed up. That's awesome. All right. So, uh, of course, if anybody needs anything from me, hit me up on Skype or Telegram. I'll see you guys again real soon. Make it a great day. You so deserve it. All right. Bye.